We're in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to start in verse 29, but I wanted to re start reading in verse 20. <clears throat> I want you all to stand and we'll go through and read it together. First Corinthians 15, 20. It says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Verse 23. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, under him it is evident that he put, who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. We'll stop right there, because that's as far as I'm getting. So let's pray. Father, we just pray uh, again this morning that you would just be speaking to us, that you would teach us, and uh, God, that the things that we learn here, that you would help us to just really apply them to our lives. Um, Lord, there's some cool things in this passage that we can share with people who need you. And uh, Father, there are some awesome promises in this passage that can get us through some hard times. And so God, we just pray that as we're going through it, that you would be speaking to our hearts and that you would bless the time in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. Okay. Last week, um, actually for the last couple of weeks, we, we've been going through this whole section on uh, the resurrection. And again, not to, not to be pedantic about the whole thing, but you gotta, some of you have not been here. But the, the issue that's taken place is the Corinthians were into Greek philosophy, and there were Greek philosophers who taught that there was no need for a physical body after you die. And so they did not believe in the resurrection. So what happened with these guys, this church in Corinth, was they started taking some of the worldly philosophy and incorporating it into Christianity. And what they did with that was they decided because the philosophers, who are the smart guys, have decided that there is no physical resurrection of the physical body, then if we're gonna be smart guys too, then we have to say that that's not going to happen. Paul says, comes back and says, okay, all you smart guys, as soon as you get rid of a physical resurrection of a physical body after death, you just got rid of Jesus's resurrection too. And if you get rid of Jesus's resurrection, you got all kinds of problems. He didn't rise from the dead. You have no proof that he's anybody that he said he was because he based all his 
um, teachings about who he was on the fact that he was going to rise from the dead. If he didn't rise, then how do you know it's true? That's the first point that he makes. If he didn't rise, we've been telling you that he rose. That makes us all liars. If he didn't rise, then there's no hope of a resurrection. If there's no hope of a resurrection, and there's, we only have hope in this life of all men, we are the most pitiable, is how he ends up that whole argument. And then he goes through and he talks about, but that's not the case. Jesus is risen from the dead. Now, one of the, one of the things that we're going to start in verse 29 here, and obviously this is the famous passage on baptism for the dead. And there are actually, in this section, three different passages that I use when I'm talking with uh, my Mormon friends. And this is, this is something that I've been dealing with actually ever since I really uh, began walking strong with, strongly with the Lord. When I got saved, I got saved when I was 16, and I had three years walking with the Lord at that point in high school, and they were rocky, to say the least. I had some, I had some real problems in high school. And, you know, it wasn't like... I didn't want to follow Jesus. It was like I couldn't find the power to follow Jesus. And so I kept flubbing up and messing up and just having a real hard time. At the end of that three years, I decided I'm going to retire as a Christian because I'm a lousy one. And so I quit. And um, actually, it's one of the few things that I ever quit in my whole life. I'm not a quitter. And so I quit because I was radically ashamed of who I was. And so that lasted for about nine months. And then I, I got so sick of myself. I just, I came back to the Lord and I was like, God, you got to do something with me. Well, one of the things that God did with me at that point when I recommitted my life to the Lord was he had set me up with a Mormon. And, um, you know, I talk about Mormonism a lot here. And the reason I talk about Mormonism a lot is not because I don't like Mormons, because I do. Um, I've had a lot of interaction with Mormons over the years and um, I like talking to them and I'm always kind with them because they have a real hard life. Um, anyway, um, I ended up working for him for two years and I witnessed to him for pretty much the whole time that I worked with him. And at the end of, the, of two years, um, you know, I figured it was gonna go one way or the other. And at the end of two years, he radically did not like the Jesus of the Bible. And that's the way that it goes when you're sharing with people. What's going to happen is they're going to make choices and they're either going to choose for Jesus or they're going to choose against Jesus. And it got to the point at the end of uh, my working with this guy that I wouldn't even talk to him about Jesus anymore. And you know, the other guys on the crew who were, more, they were always Mormons. I was the only non-Mormon on the crew. And all the other guys in the crew, I would share Jesus with those guys. And he'd say, well, why don't you talk to me anymore? And I'd go, because you already know it. And you've already rejected Christ. And you're going to burn hot enough, dude. And so that's how we talk. And, <laughs> and he'd go. <laughs> you know, he, he always had this thing. When, when I would say stuff to him, he'd go, his mouth would come open. And he'd go, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and then we'd go on to something. It was just hilarious when it would happen. Any, in any case, when I first started working for this guy, you know, I just committed my life to the Lord and I knew almost nothing. I did know, uh, some people had talked to me about Mormonism and I didn't know that there was, there was some different beliefs that Mormon ha Mormons had from Christians. And I didn't even know what all those were. And so when I first started talking with this guy, one of the first things I asked him was, I could still remember, I was on the 91 freeway driving south with him. Um, right at the Arlington exit. And at that point I was talking to him, and this is in Riverside. Um, I was talking to him and I said, do you believe that Jesus is the son of God? I said, yes, I do. And I said, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? And he said, yes, I do. Do you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, do you believe in the Trinity? And he said, yes, I believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And I was like, this guy's almost a Christian, okay? And I was like, what's, a, what's the deal there? And so I went and got some books on Mormonism and I started reading up and I found out that what he had done was he had gone through and, well, he hadn't, the Mormon church had gone through and redefined everything. And so one of the things, the passage that we dealt with last week, verse 28, it says, now when all things are made subject to him, talking about to Jesus, then the son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him that God may be all in all. 
And so even though they believe that Jesus is the son of God, they believe it in a different way than the Bible teaches. What they believe is that God, the father, what, the, what they call Elohim, is up in heaven. He's got a bunch of wives and he, ha he has relations with all these wives and that Jesus literally was born of relations between him and one of his spirit wives, okay? So that's how you get Jesus. That, by the way, is how you get everybody. That's how you get everybody in this room. You're all spirit babies up in heaven before. That's how you get Satan. That's how you get all the demons. And that's why you'll hear people say that Mormons believe that Jesus and Lucifer are brothers, and they do, if they know Mormon doctrine. And the problem there is that Lucifer had a bad plan. Jesus had a good plan. Uh, Elohim went with a good plan, and Lucifer got all ticked off, and that's where you get all the demons from. He got a bunch of the children of Elohim to rebel against him. And that's all Mormon doctrine. Okay, and so Jesus in Mormonism, they'll say that he's the son of God, but that's part of what they mean from that. And then on top of it, when they talk about the virgin birth, they believe that what happened was Elohim literally came down and had sex with Mary, literally, went into the bedroom, climbed on top of her, had sex with Mary. And I said, you know, when I found that out, I went, Rick, you said that you believe Jesus was born of a virgin, that Mary was a virgin when Jesus was born. And she goes, well, he goes, well, she was. And I go, well, how do you figure that? She had sex with Elohim. And he went, well, it's because Elohim's not human. And I went, well, if she would have had sex with a dog, would she still be a virgin? That's how you talk in construction. <laughs> I just wanted to make it clear to him. And he said, well, no. And I go, he goes, well, the Holy Spirit overshadowed him. Overshadowed what? She still had sex with the guy. She is not a virgin after you have physical relations with any one thing. You are not a virgin anymore. And that's one of those times where he went, oh, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. I love Rick. Rick's a, Rick's a great guy. And so that was one of those things. And he didn't believe that Jesus was on the same plane as Elohim. And so one of the things that he would do with me is he'd take me to passages like that. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the son of himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him that God may be all in all. And so see, Jesus is lesser than the father. And so he's not God is basically what they, what they would say. At least not the God of this planet, that kind of thing. And so what I, what I would do with that is I go, okay, like we did last week, being subject to somebody, and this is for those of you who weren't here last week, being subject to somebody doesn't make you less of what you are than if you're not subject to them. And this is what I mean by that. In the Bible, the Bible says that my wife is to submit to me as the church submits to Christ. So she's supposed to be like the church and I'm supposed to be like Jesus. And so she is submitting herself to me. At that point, does, does that make me more human? Because we're both humans. Does that make me more human than she is? And the answer to that is no. Does that make me smarter than she is? No. Does that make me, you know, more practical than she is? No. All it means is she submits. That's all it means. It doesn't mean anything else. It doesn't say anything else about anything else that there is to say about anything. It just means that she submits, right? And so it's the same thing with my children. My children are to be subject to me and so the fact that they're subject to me does not make me more of what I am than what they are. So they're not less human because they submit to me. So Jesus' na Jesus's nature does not change because he submits to somebody. And ultimately, you know what? The Bible says that Jesus submitted to every single one of us. He came to be a servant to us. And so if Jesus is serving me, that makes me somebody that's being served, he being the servant, does that make him something less as far as his, as his nature goes than I am? That's nonsense. He in fact has a nature that's way above mine. And so, you know, he's God in human flesh. And the fact that he comes to be a servant doesn't mean that he's given any of that up. So all that means is that Jesus subjects himself to the father. That's all it means. Doesn't mean anything else. Then the next one, that I would talk with these guys about is in verse 29. Otherwise, what will they, notice that pronoun, doesn't say we, Paul's not doing this. What will they do who are baptized for the dead? It doesn't even say you. What will you do in Corinth who are baptized for the dead? 
So that does not say that Paul is doing that. That doesn't even say that the Corinthians are doing that. It might be some of the Corinthians, but the majority of these guys obviously aren't doing it because Paul uses the pronoun they. So somebody's baptizing for the dead and it's not Paul and it's not most of the Corinthians at the very least. And it's probably not any of them that are baptizing for the dead. And this is one of those passages that when you go through and you look at it, this, you know, there, there are not many of these in the Bible, but this is one of those where there's like 200 different interpretations of the passage. And so what happened was um, Joseph Smith came along in the 1830s and he decided that he had the interpretation and he told us what it is. And what that, and I'm giving you Mormon doctrine again, the whole idea of baptism for the dead, um, most people don't know a lot about Mormon doctrine, but you'll, you'll notice that they're really into genealogies. And um, part of the reason that they're into genealogies is because they go back through their family history and even the history of friends, families, and that kind of stuff, and they find out who are non-Mormons. And then they will go into the temple and they'll be baptized by proxy for these people. And the reason that they're doing that is because Mormons believe that there are different heavens and so there's a passage in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul talks about the fact that he went to the third heaven. And so Joseph Smith came up with, okay, well, there's three heavens. And so there's the telestial heaven and the terrestrial heaven and the celestial heaven. And the telestial heaven is the lowest one. And that's basically where people who aren't so great go, rotten people go to the, the telestial heaven. And then people who are nice people go to the terrestrial heaven. And so that's, that's most of you. Mormons would tell you that you would go to the terrestrial heaven. But then there's a higher heaven, which is the celestial heaven, and that's the third heaven. Here's, here's how the Bible terms those things. When God created the heavens and the earth, it's heavens, plural. There is the heavens that cover the earth. That's the atmosphere, it's where the birds dwell. And then there's space, the final frontier, that's the second heaven. And then the third heaven is where God dwells. That's all Paul is saying. I went to heaven where God dwells, basically. And so what, what Joseph Smith comes up with is this whole thing. And so um, if you're going to be a real good person, you have to be involved in the Mormon church, and then you get to go to the celestial heaven. And so one of the conversations that um, I had with these, with these guys at one point was I, I you know, uh, again, I was working with a bunch of Mormons. And so... Um, the com one of the conversations that I would always have with these guys was this, if I die, where am I going? And they didn't have their Mormon doctrine down uh, because they all said that I was going to the celestial heaven because I was a really good guy and I read my Bible. I, I would take my Bible to work with me and I would read it at breaks. You know, that's what we do. And so I would take my Bible to work with me and, and read it at breaks and stuff. And so they, and they saw me changing over time and I was in love with Jesus and stuff. And so they go, you, you know, Steve, you're a good guy. I, I think you're gonna to go to the celestial heaven, but you know what? You're gonna be on the lowest level of the celestial heaven because they have levels in the celestial heaven too. And your highest level is you get to be a God, have your own planet and start the whole thing over. You're the next God of another planet. And so they would say that to me. They didn't have it right because Joseph Smith wouldn't have said that, neither would Brigham Young. He would have, they would have said, actually, um, because I'm a pastor now, I wasn't a pastor then, but because I'm a pastor now, I probably end up in hell. Okay. Um, they, they have a hell for um, apostates. That's one of the reasons when you're, when you're sharing with a Mormon, they have a real hard time. You have to understand this about these guys. They have a real hard time because they're told that if they ever leave Mormonism, they're apostate and they're going to hell. Well, nobody goes to hell except for apostates and murderers, basically. And so that's one of the things that they're dealing with. And my friend Rick, I know why he, he never became a Christian. It was because if he did, he would have lost his family. He was like third generation Mormon. And um, his whole family, his wife would have left him. And, you know, we had conversations about that. And you know that whole thing where Jesus said, if you love your husband or your wife more than me, you're not worthy of me? Sometimes Mormons are people who are dealing with that issue specifically. They're afraid to lose their families. And so, you know, you don't just pick on those people. You gotta be compassionate with them because they're, you, if, when a Mormon comes to Christ, he, they've been taught all their life, if they leave Mormonism, they become apostate and they're going to hell. 
That's a huge issue. When a Mormon comes to Christ, many times their families won't talk to them anymore, depending on where they're from. And you know, how, how, serious, how serious they are about Mormonism. And so they're making huge choices when they come. And so you have to understand that when you're talking to these guys. The 18 year olds that are coming to your door, they're just kids. And they've left their families and they're off on their, on their missions and they're coming up and talking to you. And you sit there and you, you share with them and you're being all rational with them and you can't figure out what, you know, what's your problem. Why don't you just get it and come to Jesus? Well, there's all kinds of stuff that's going on in the background. Can you imagine you're 18 years old, you're gonna go back home and you're gonna tell your parents who sent you on the mission that I ditched Mormonism. I'm going, they're gonna go, they're gonna be ashamed of you. They're, your whole church is ashamed. It's a big, huge pressure issue in, in those. And so you have to be compassionate with these guys. In any case, that whole level thing in heaven is where the baptism for the dead thing comes from. So what they will do is they will, again, get names and um, they will go in and by proxy, um, get baptized for somebody who's dead and they think that what that does is it shifts them from one level to the next. Because you died not being a Mormon and say you're in the terrestrial kingdom, so you get baptized for them and up you go into the celestial because of that. And that's, where that, you know, that's what Joseph Smith said. There were another group called the Marcionites in the second century who were doing some of that stuff too. And you know, one of the, one of the things that that's predicated upon is the idea that baptism does something to change your spiritual state. That baptism makes you something that you weren't before you got baptized. You follow me? Otherwise, what's the point? And what the Bible says baptism is for is to identify with Jesus. Jesus said that if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you also before my father. And one of the things that Christians went through was baptism and they lived, you know, pretty much if you're talking about Israel, it's a desert place. And so people congregated around water. And so when you got baptized, everybody knew that you just became a Christian. And it's that kind of thing. And so the same thing baptism does is the same thing that witnessing to people do, does or telling, just telling people that you're following Jesus now. A lot of times when people become Christians, they're a little bit afraid to let everybody around them know what's happening because they're afraid of the ridicule that comes up. And that's what Jesus was dealing with in that passage. You have to love me more than you love these people. So don't deny me. Are you gonna follow me or not? And so that's part of what baptism was about. And it wasn't even until the third century in the church that anybody in church ever started teaching that baptism did anything for you as far as changing you spiritually. What the Bible says that baptism is, is an out, it's an outward showing of what's already happened on the inside. The Bible says that when you get baptized, you're not getting washed, you're getting buried. And so in Romans chapter six, it says, when you get dunked down into the water, that's like a burial. And when you get pulled back up out of the water, that's like rising from the dead. Baptism is a burial. And so what you're saying is that what I was died and now what I am now is alive and I live through the power of Christ now. That's what baptism represents. And there'll be people who argue with that and they'll say things like, well, you know, Jesus said in John chapter three that um, you need to be born of water and born of the spirit. So see, you need to get baptized. Otherwise you're not going to heaven. Let's go back and look at that real quick. John chapter three. This is Nic a guy named Nicodemus comes to Jesus. He's rich. Um, he's a man of, uh, he's a popular guy, man with power. And he's highly religious. He's a Pharisee on the Sanhedrin and he's a wealthy man. So he's got riches, he's got power, and he is the top in the top of his game as far as religion goes. And he comes to Jesus by night because he's afraid of what people are gonna think about him going to Jesus. And he comes because he's afraid. And the reason he's afraid is because he's got everything that, that people told him he's supposed to have to get to heaven and he doesn't think he's going. And so he comes up and he says, he has a speech for Jesus. And he says, 
We know that you're a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus says, verily, verily, or most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Doesn't even respond to what the guy says. He responds to what the guy's thinking. And so Nicodemus is coming up and giving Jesus a speech and Jesus goes, Nicodemus, I'm telling you, you're never going to see heaven unless you're born again. And Nicodemus knows what he's thinking because he replies and he goes, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And what Nicodemus is thinking that Jesus, is that Jesus wants him to be born again. And he goes, how am I gonna do that? I can't crawl back into my mom too big, right? It won't work. And then Jesus says to him, most, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then my Mormon's friends would shut their Bibles and say, see, you have to be baptized if you're gonna enter the kingdom of God. Does that say baptized in there anywhere? Do you see the word baptism in that passage? You can go through and read the whole rest of chapter three and you know how many times you're gonna see the word baptism? Not once in the red there. Jesus doesn't talk about baptism. And in the next verse, he explains it. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And so basically what Jesus does is explains it. He, when he says being born, talks about being born again, it's the idea of being born twice. So he says, the first birth is a fleshly birth. The second birth is a spiritual birth. And so, and he equates that with being born of water and of the spirit. And the easiest interpretation of that is he says, everybody's been born physically, born of water. You know, you get carried around in a sack of water when your mom is having you, all of that stuff. So everybody's born physically. You have to be born again spiritually if you're gonna enter into the kingdom of God. And the Bible doesn't teach that you're born again spiritually when you get baptized. In fact, the Bible teaches that the only way that you're getting to heaven is by faith in the unmerited favor of God. There's a passage in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 that says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And so when you're talking about going to heaven, what Jesus, what, what Paul says there is that nobody's getting to heaven based on his works. So when I stand before the pearly gates and I'm standing there before God and God says, so what makes you think that you should get to enter my heaven? My answer is not going to be, I was a pastor. I read my Bible. I taught Bible studies. I got baptized. I, you know, I, I, I. It's not gonna be any of that. It's gonna be, there's no reason for me to get in here except for the fact that, Lord, you shed your blood for me and you're giving me things that I don't deserve. I don't deserve heaven. I deserve, if I'm getting what I deserve, it's hell. I'm really not interested in that, right? And so, you know, that's, again, that's predicated on that whole thing and even that passage doesn't teach that. What Jesus is teaching is that you have to be born physically, obviously everybody is, and then you're born spiritually, born again. And he goes on with a, with a passage, not one mention of baptism anywhere in there. Here's another thing. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter one. 1 Corinthians chapter one. And Paul, when he's talking about baptism, and again, this, this church is divvied up over philosophies. And what they started doing was, you know, in... in Grecian philosophy, you had all these teachers. And so you might have Aristotle or you might have Socrates or Plato. That ends up being pretty much the same thing. And so you go, I'm of Aristotle or I'm of Socrates, that kind of thing. What these guys started doing was taking that same kind of attitude, bringing it into Christianity. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, it says, for it's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, that's another name for Peter, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? And what they were doing was treating these guys like philosophers. Well, I'm of the school of Paul, or I'm of the school of Christ, that kind of thing. And Paul says, that's nonsense. 
And then he goes on and he says, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Um, besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And I would just submit to you that Paul did not believe that baptism changed you spiritually. And the reason that, he, that you can see that is because of what he says about it. If baptism is what saves you, Paul would never make this statement. So for example, if baptism, if I thought that when I dunked you in water, you immediately changed spiritually and now you're going to heaven, I would never say anything along the lines of, I'm glad I never baptized you. That's crazy. I wanna baptize everybody then, right? And let's just go through and change the words. So if baptism equals salvation, let's throw salvation in there. He says, is Christ divine? Well, let's start in verse 14. I thank God that I saved none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Well, that doesn't really work. Lest anyone should say that I had saved you in my own name. Yes, I also saved the household of Stephanus because I do not know whether I saved any other for Christ did not send me to save people. That doesn't work. Obviously, Jesus did send me to go out and preach the gospel and get people saved. And so that's, you know, and again, people who believe that baptism is salvation would never say that. And so Paul does not agree with those people. Get it? Okay, so back to that whole thing. So baptizing somebody in proxy for the dead is not going to change their spiritual state because getting baptized doesn't change your spiritual state. One of the things that I ask people when they come down and get baptized me is this, are you gonna follow Jesus for the rest of your life? Have you given your heart to Christ? And sometimes, especially when they're younger, I'll turn them around and I'll have them look at everybody and I'll go, see all these people? What you're saying to them is that from now on, you're going to be with Jesus for the rest of your life. You're gonna do that? And they all go, yep, I'm gonna do that. Oh, okay. And then, and then we dunk them and, you know, I'm not, I'm not changing anything with those guys. They've already make the, made the commitment to follow Christ. They're already going for it with him. That's just an outward sign of what happened inwardly, right? That's the deal with that. One of the things that, um, and I'm, I'm giving you some witnessing tools for uh, talking with, uh, again, with your Mormon friends, is this whole thing of, of changing levels, levels of heaven and stuff. One of the things that I always shared with those guys was, you know, actually one of the reasons that I would ask them where they thought I was going. Now, and again, they all said, you're going to the celestial kingdom. Um, and, and so I said, so basic, this is how the conversation would go. I go, so if I'm wrong and Mormonism is right, the Bible's wrong and Mormonism is true, then where am I going after I die? And they would all say, Celestial kingdom, you're a great guy, Steve. And I go, okay, so do you know where you're going if I'm right and you're wrong? And basically at that point I go, for what reason would I switch to Mormonism? And you better be right or, or else you got some real problems coming, Bucky. You know, and it was that kind of thing. And so then when we go on, the, go on with the conversation. So what does that mean? And the ultimate answer is nobody knows what that means. Like I said before, 200 different interpretations of that and you know, um, nobody knows for sure. I'm gonna give you the real interpretation though right now. I'm just, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just joking with you. I'll just give you some options. Some people think that what these guys, it's a military term actually, when, he says, when they say baptize for the dead. Um, uh, so some people think that what they were doing was filling ranks. So they wanted a certain amount of people who were baptized Christians in their uh, fellowship. So say they were only, only wanted their members to be 100 people in their fellowship. Everyone, every time somebody kicked off, then they'd allow somebody else in and they were baptizing for the dead. So that's one option. But you don't know that because it doesn't say it, right? Um, another option is that some people, uh, that um, maybe they were baptizing over the dead. And there is some history where Christians used to get baptized in cemeteries. 
So they go down. I don't know how they were doing it. You know, take a dunk dunk tank down to the cemetery or something. Or, you know, maybe they were sprinkling them. But anyway, they go into a cemetery and it was a picture of the fact that they were going to rise from the dead. So they'd literally do it in a cemetery and go, this is what, like what's happening. You're getting buried, you know, baptize you. And then they raise them up. And it's like these, you know, it's looking forward to the future resurrection. So that might be an option. That might be one. So that's a second one. Or... The, some people think that it like, might literally mean being baptized for the resurrection of the dead. And like I said before, baptism represents resurrection, so maybe that's what they, they're speaking about. Here's another one. Or baptized for the dead, the dead being singular, and the dead one being Jesus. So I'm baptized for Jesus in the sense of I, I'm identifying with him. So that's an option. So baptized for the dead, baptized for Jesus. And why would I do that if Jesus is never, you know, if Jesus never rose, that kind of thing. Um, or, and actually I'd like this one the best. These guys are philosophers. They think they're philosophers. They're into Greek philosophy. There was this group of guys down in the area of Corinth who were pagans and they were philosophers and they followed a guy named Eleusis. And um, he came up with what were called the Eleusinian Mysteries. And one of the things that these Gnostics did was they went down to the sea and they had these washings that they did in the sea that were needed to experience bliss on the, you know, in the afterlife. And they would go down and wash themselves vicariously or in place of other people who had already died. And so there's a possibility that Paul's just talking about some of their Gnostics. And so he's like, you don't, you know, you don't believe in the resurrection We've been preaching it to you. And even some of the Gnostics that you guys follow believe in a resurrection. And so if they believe it, why wouldn't you? And that would be the argument there. So in any case, I don't know what the answer to that is. That's my favorite one so far. Talk to me next year, I might have another one. Okay? But again, the passage doesn't say it, except for this. It says they. So they is not Paul. They is not the people that he's specifically talking to. They may be some people in their church, but it's certainly not all of them. And they may be nobody in their church. Follow that? Okay. So in in any case, he goes on here and he says, and why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you, um, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And Paul goes on and he says, you know, one of the things that the resurrection is good for is it sustains us. You know, I have fought beasts at Ephesus. What would be the point of doing that if there's no resurrection? And what he's talking about is what the Romans would do with Christians. In the early centuries of Christianity, the Romans would literally throw these people to the lions or dogs or whatever other animal that they had. And so you becoming a Christian might end you up in a Roman arena. There are stories about Christians where they literally would cover these people with um, grease wrap them up in nets, and then turn dogs loose on wolves, loose on them in the arena, and have everybody watch them die by being eaten alive. There were other times when, you know, they would, they would send them in there, a group of Christians, and they just turned lions and tigers in on them. And there are stories where literally the Christians would go walking in, they know they're not getting out of there, because even if they... Um, fought with the lions and tigers, the, you know, especially in Rome, they're not going to let, let you out. You're there to be executed. And so they just come along and stick you with a sword. And so they just go into the middle of the arena. They'd all get in a circle and they begin singing hymns to God and they would die radically. And the animals would come and take them out. And literally there would be a hush on the arena while the people are watch, watching. You know, they start off with shouting and screaming and that kind of stuff. And then they watch how they die. And many times that was the reason that most of the Romans came to follow Christ. There are stories of people dying for Jesus and literally the soldiers who were putting them to death becoming Christians on the spot and dying themselves at that point. What a way to evangelize, right? And the people who would do that are doing that because they have a hope that doesn't match anybody else's. What, what people in the world do 
is when they're, when they're in a situation where they think that they're going to die, they're desperate. They're desperate. They want to hold on to life with everything that they've got. And it's not that I don't like life and I wouldn't want to hold on to it, but I'm not desperate. I know what happens afterwards and I know where I'm going. And I'm not going there because I'm a great guy. I'm going there because I know a great guy. It's Jesus, right? And people who die that way are radically different than others, right? And Paul apparently had been put into the arena at Ephesus and he'd come out alive. Apparently he'd fought the beasts and I don't know, won or something. In any case, he also talks about, uh, I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Like I'm literally putting myself to death. What's he talking about there? And what he's talking about is this principle that you have in scripture that we need to die to ourselves. Again, it's a, it's a picture of, of what baptism is all about. What I used to be died. And now I've got this brand new life in Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 in that passage about that. And what he's talking about is what Jesus said in Matthew 10. Remember that, I already referenced it, where Jesus said, you don't love your mother, you know, if you, if you love your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, your wife, your husband more than me, your children more than me, you're not worthy of me. And if you love your life more than me, you're not worthy of me. And if you don't take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me. And a lot of people get um, kind of hung up on the taking up the cross and following Jesus. And I've seen it taken all kinds of different ways. So, you know, like the cross is some symbol that you're supposed to carry around. And so I've known, known guys who carried big crosses around and used it to witness, nothing wrong with that but that's not what it means by taking up your cross and following Jesus. And other people have, have thought that taking up your cross is, is carrying some burden. So I've got a burden and my burden is my husband or my burden is my wife. Oh, I've got a cross to bear, it's my husband. You know, I've got a cross to bear, it's my children. You know, it's, I've got a cross to bear, it's my boss, it's my job, you know, that kind of thing. That's not what a, carrying a cross did. If you were carrying a cross in the first century, like if you were walking down the street with a cross on your back in the first century, you know what's going to happen in a few minutes? They were going to nail you to it. You're, 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 that's like walking the green mile. That's like, you know, you're going to the gas chamber. That's the idea behind that. That's what carrying a cross did. And what Jesus was talking about was you need to die to yourself. And one of the things that's going to happen um, with each one of us is that God's going, to, well, let's just use me. God's going to get rid of me. Literally. He's going to get rid of me. Everything that Steve Winery was when we started out is going to be gone by the time that we get done in the sense of all the junk and all the, all the worldly stuff and, and all that kind of stuff. And God's in the process of doing that stuff with me. And so when the Bible talks about dying to yourself and dying daily, it's the idea of, I don't wanna be what I was before. I don't wanna be like that anymore. And you know, there, there were times when, specifically when I was backslidden, that I would just sit in front of my mirror and in my bathroom and I would lean on the sink and I'd, look, I'd just be looking in the mirror and go, what's wrong with you? What is wrong with you? And I just do some stupid thing and I just like, you're such an idiot. What is wrong with you? And, you know, finally, obviously, I got, I got done with that, and I decided that I want to follow Jesus. The guy's my only hope. He takes all the junk that was in my life, and he begins taking it away, and he changes me. He changes me. There's a passage in Psalms that says, you have no changes, therefore you do not fear God. And when you have a walk with God, what God does is he comes in and he, and he starts putting to death everything that, all the junk that you were, and he starts making you into something brand new. And that's finally going to be finished when you go home to be with the Lord. And all the junk that was ever Steve Winery is going to be gone. I'm going to be in the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, in my mansion, leaning on the, on the, on the sink in front of my mirror going, looking pretty good, dude. <laughs> because it's going to be perfect at that point, but until then, I die daily is what's supposed to be happening. He goes on and he says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And what Paul's saying there is you got people in your fellowship that don't even know the Lord and you are hanging with them and what's happening is it's corrupting you. And that's 
pitiful. When, when he says, I speak that to your shame, that's a sad situation that you could have people in your fellowship who don't have the knowledge of God and who are comfortable with that. I've never gotten that. I've never understood the whole, I'm a non-Christian, I'm not gonna give my life to Jesus, but I'm going to come to church thing. If I was going to be a non-Christian and that's where I was going to be, what would I be here for? There's a football game on. You know what I mean? There's all kinds of other stuff going on. If I'm going to be a non-Christian, I would just be a non-Christian. Why would I be a non-Christian and go to church? And why do I, why would I, when, when people come to here, come here and there have been people who've come here for years and I look at them and I go, hmm, you are a sadomasochist because you like getting beat up every Sunday. What is the deal with that? So I, I, I just don't get that. It's like you're in or you're out. And if you're going to come, why don't you just get in instead of just coming and being out? What's the deal with that? I just don't get it. And if, if people are coming because they're comfortable with my preaching and they like to hear it, then that's saying something about my preaching, isn't it? And it's nothing good, is what I'm saying to you. That's nothing good. Because they should be getting convicted and going, either I'm, either I'm gonna <laughs> do what the guy says I'm supposed to do or I'm gonna get out of here because he's a crazy maniac. You know, and that's what I'm telling you. You need to make a choice here. Take your pick, do something, don't just sit there. And because that's not how it's supposed to go. It's not supposed to go that way. You hear the gospel, you hear about Jesus, you gotta make a choice about him. Do something with it. Otherwise, all you're doing is heaping up judgment. Did you know that? One of the most dangerous places to be if you're not gonna follow Christ is in church. Because what's happening is you're getting more and more knowledge and you are accountable for the things that you know. There are a couple of parables that Jesus told about that. Parable of the talents, parable of the minas. You know that whole thing? Jesus gives out talents gives out 10, you know, 10 talents to one guy and so many others to another guy and he gives one talent to another guy, or that might be the minus. In any case, he gives it, gives it out to him and the, the first two go out and they multiply it. They do business with what God's given to them and Jesus, you know, the Lord says, you know, well done and he rewards them for it. The last guy goes, well, you know, I took what you gave me and I went and dug a hole and I stuck it, stuck it in the hole and the reason that I did it is because you're mean and you go out trying to collect what you didn't sow. You try to reap what you didn't sow, that kind of thing. And basically, it doesn't say that in the text, but that's what he's saying. I knew that you were an austere man and you reap where you, do, where you did not sow. You expect things that you didn't do. And so I was afraid, so I went and buried it. And what the Lord does at that point is he goes, well, I'll just judge you by your words. Since you were so afraid of me and I'm so mean, then what you should have done was taken it and put it in the bank so I could get back what I, what I gave you with interest. But you didn't really think I was mean, did you? And it was, you know, it's that kind of thing. And so, you know, you are accountable for the things that you hear. You gotta do something with this stuff. So if you've been coming here for a period of time and you've never committed your life to Christ, do it or don't. Get in or get out. Do something. Don't just sit there. You're like a frog in boiling water. You know how to boil a frog? You do it slowly. You stick them in water. You turn the heat up just a little bit at a time. That frog will sit there forever until he boils to death. And that's what some people's lives are like. They just put it off, put it off, put it off, put it off, nothing affects them anymore. And they literally put themselves in a place of judgment. Awake to righteousness, do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. And then he, says, he also says, evil company corrupts good habits. That's always been true. When um, I have blown it as a Christian, when I've blown it big time, it's because I was hanging out with people in places that I shouldn't have been. And that's why the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Because what, um, you know, what place does righteousness have with unrighteousness, light with darkness, Christ with the devil, that whole thing. Because you're gonna become like the people that you hang out with. You're going to talk like them, you're going to think like them, and you are going to act like them. 
That's the way that it always works. And you may think that you're stronger than that, and you're not. I'm a really disciplined guy, and I'm a really strong-willed guy, and every time that I blew it, it's because I was hanging out with guys that I shouldn't have been hanging out with, every single time. And they molded me into their image, every single time. And I was the leader guy, still getting molded into their image. Wasn't su such a leader, was I? And that's, that's the situation with everything. That's why God says that. Evil com uh, company corrupts good habits. So you have to watch out for that. Then he goes on and he ta starts talking about the resurrection body and people um, making fun of that basically. And he says, verse 35, but someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? It's like, oh yeah, the dead are gonna be raised up. What are they, zombies? What kind of body are they gonna have? What are you talking about? And you can tell that he's talking about people mocking because of the next verse. It says, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body. So the principle that he used there is sowing seed, right? Jesus used that also in John chapter 12. He says, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So what they're, do, what they're doing is talking about basic principles of sowing stuff. So I haven't planted a whole lot of things in my life. The, some of the stuff that I planted the most is like corn. So when you're gonna grow corn, what you do is you take a little corn kernel, you stick a little hole in the ground, you put it in there, you cover it up and you start watering it and out comes a big, huge kernel of corn, right? Wrong, and that's the point that he's making. It does, you don't have a big, huge kernel of corn come in because you put in a kernel of corn. What you have come out is something that looks like grass. It sprouts up, it becomes a stalk. The stalk grows, you know, eight feet tall. And off of that comes ears of corn, not just big kernels of corn. He says it's the same principle in the resurrection. What gets planted isn't what's coming out. What gets planted is totally different than what's going to come out. That's good news. Because the older you get, usually when people die, they die in old age, generally, in our culture, right? So have you ever wondered what you're gonna look like in heaven? So are you gonna be bald in heaven? I mean, the last, last thing that you were when you died, wrinkled and, and messed up and bald, is that what's gonna happen to me when I get to heaven? And I've seen pictures of people in heaven that were bald. And I was like, that's not right. <laughs> in fact, if you want to get it right, then God is fair. So I have no hair. Many of you do. Talking about the men. I don't care about the women. Well, maybe I do. You have hair. I do not. If God is fair, when we get to heaven, I will have a full head of hair. You will have none. <laughs> All the bald guys. Amen? Amen. All right. Okay. In any case, so again, what you're, what you're talking about is when you go to heaven, when, when, when Paul's talking about the resurrection and the body and all that kind of stuff, heaven and stuff, it's not gonna be the same as what we've got here. It's gonna be something that's significantly different on the better scale. It's going to get better here. He goes on and says, all flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. Paul the apostle had no idea what he was saying there at the time, but it's absolutely scientifically correct. We all come from the same genetic code as far as DNA goes, and it is a code, but the code is absolutely different for every animal on the planet. And so there, the flesh of, of men versus the flesh of animals, the flesh of fish, the flesh of birds, they're all radically different on the, on the cellular level, on the, actually on the molecular level, radically different. That's, that's genetics there. And Paul shouldn't know anything about that. But because God was speaking through him, you have those kinds of statements scientifically accurate. And then he goes on and he says, there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. And so what he's talking about there is one of two things. He's either talking about celestial bodies as far as the stars up in heaven versus the earth and planets and things like that. Or he's talking about my body, which is fit for 
the earth, which is terrestrial, versus spiritual bodies, which are fit for the heavens. So it's one of those two. I think it's the second one, and here's why. If he's saying that it's stars versus planets, the problem is in the first century, planets were considered to be stars that moved. They didn't know that they were planets. They didn't have telescopes. And so there wouldn't be planets. There'd be only one, and it would be Earth. Actually, there would be planets, but there would only be one terrestrial arena, and that would be the Earth. And so it would be, there are celestial bodies, and then there is the terrestrial body, singular, if he was talking about the Earth. So I think he's talking about celestial bodies being spiritual bodies, or bodies fit for the heavens, that's what celestial means, versus terrestrial bodies, bodies fit for the Earth. That's cool, because right now I have a body that's fit for the Earth. It's made to be on the planet. And if you take this body and you take it too far up, like up past 20,000 feet, I start having problems and I croak and die. Okay, if you get, you know, 75 miles, actually 67 miles up, that's the beginning of space, and you throw me out the space capsule, and what happens is my blood boils, my, eye pop, my eyes pop, and it's not a good thing. Because my body is fit for the earth, it's not fit for space or for the heavens, right? Same thing, you take me to Mars, not good. Any other place, not good. But if I'm on the earth, I can do all kinds of things. And as a matter of fact, I could even walk around the earth in about a year. It kept up the, the pace and, and that kind of thing, you just figure it out. It's only 25,000 miles, you know, 24,000 some odd miles around the equator. You don't even have to go around the equator. If you could walk and get places, it wouldn't take you very long. It's, you know, in other words, I can get places here, right? But if I want to go to Mars, for example, 40 million miles at its closest approach, that's a long journey through a place where my blood boils and my eyes pop, right? Not good. If you want, if, even if I want to go to the moon, 250,000 miles, quarter of a million miles. And again, blood popping or blood boiling, eye popping kind of stuff. And there's nothing there when I get there, right? And so you got that whole thing. So apparently my body's going to be significantly different. It's different. It's going to be a body fit for the heavens. And this is what's cool about it. When you look at Jesus's body after the resurrection, he had a celestial one and a spiritual one, like it says later on, which means that I get to have a body like Jesus's. It's always this comparison thing, right? And so when they, when, when they went to examine Jesus at the resurrection, they got there, the tomb was empty, and it says that Pete, they, Peter went in and looked at, it, at the grave clothes. And like I was talking about last week, it was like a cocoon that had collapsed. That's what the Greek says. It's like this cocoon that collapsed. So that, what that tells you is that Jesus didn't rip the clothes off. Jesus went through them or disappeared out of them, Right? And then the stone was rolled away. Well, you know, the stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out. The stone was rolled away so that the women could get in. And Peter and John, and those guys. So that people would know that he's not there anymore. And then when you see the resurrection appearances, he's not walking through walls. He's not walking through closed doors. He's appearing in the middle of the room. You have to fold yourself through six dimensions of space to do that. So apparently, when I get my celestial body, folding myself through six dimensions of the space, whoop, 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 you know, <laughs> flipping it around and yeep, I'm gone. Or I appear in the middle of something. That would be cool. That would be very useful, right? So new heaven and new earth, new Jerusalem, I may be popping in and out of your mansion just to flip you out, right? And if you can do that stuff, the last thing that they see Jesus doing is ascending. The Bible says he ascends. Okay, let's use the word ascend. When I'm ascending something, like if there was a staircase up here and I was going to ascend the staircase, that means I'm going up the staircase on my own power. The Bible doesn't see, say that Jesus was caught away. It says that he ascended. That means he goes up under his own power. And what the Bible says is that he went up into the clouds and a cloud received them out of their sight. So every time that I see those big puffy clouds out there, that's what I think of. Actually, Robin was telling me that, that with the kids, when they're talking about the ascension, they take balloons out there and they just take the kids out and they let the balloons go and tell them to watch the balloons until they disappear into the clouds. And that's what Jesus did. That's cool, right? And so I don't know how he did that. I don't know if he, if he just kind of did it like this or if he... 
some music playing in the background, maybe a sound effect, whoosh, you know, that kind of thing. But he took off and he left. That's a body that's fit for the heavens. It can disappear, fold itself through dimensions of space. It can take off. It can do that kind of stuff. So I think that when you get to the new heavens and the new earth, it, it, it says it's, you know, it's like it's going to be better than what we've got. So I don't think it's going to be less than what we have. So say I want to go to Mars or something. I just go, whoop, and off I go, ding, you know, I'm on Mars. That's a body fit for the heaven, because it's a long ways. So if I want to go to the closest star, right now it's 4.6, 4.32 light years away, something like that. If I want to go to the closest star, it'd take centuries to get there. But celestial body, you know, it's better than a transporter beam. Whoop, off I am, I'm there. Looking forward to it. It's going to be awesome, right? He goes on and says, there's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body's sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. So when you die, what's going to happen is you're going to, your body's going to fail. It's going to begin to corrupt. And it's already corrupting now because of the fall, because of sin and disease and all that kind of stuff. And when it's raised, there's not going to be any of that anymore. It's sown in dishonor. It's going to be raised in glory. It's, it's sown in weakness. It's going to be raised in power. I like the power thing. One of the things, you know, I, I, I came from a background where I did sports and that whole thing. And what we were always into was power. If you're going to play your sport, you have to get stronger. And so I work on my legs. My legs are big. I work on my neck. I work on my upper body as far as arm strength and upper body strength and stuff because of the sports that I was involved in and what I wanted was more power. I wanted to be able to do it faster, do it harder, do, it, do all of that stuff. And that's great and some people are still into that and they stay in that as, as, uh, you know, as they get older and that kind of thing, but it only works for so long. And then pretty soon your body just starts decaying and it's gonna end up weak. And so I know that when I die, I'm going to end up weak. I'm already weaker than I was when I was 18. You know, it's like the whole running thing. I used to be able to run real fast and my knees won't take it, right? And so it's going to end up like that. But it's going to be raised in power. And so that's why I think that everybody who is raised from the dead has 22-inch biceps. I'm just joking. So in a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And so it's written, the first man, Adam, became a life-giving being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Or excuse me, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. First man was the earth made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. That's the third thing that I would share with my Mormon friends. We would talk about this stuff. Because in Mormonism, they teach that, like I was saying before, that before everybody came here, that they, they were spirit children up in heaven. God had a bunch of spirit babies. And then what happens is when we have babies, God takes the spirits from those spirit babies up in heaven and sticks them in the bodies of these people. That's what Brigham Young, Joseph Smith, those guys taught. Well, what the Bible teaches is something significantly different. And what it teaches is that you weren't here before you were born in the flesh. That what comes first is natural, not spiritual. What comes first is natural and afterward comes the spiritual. And so I wasn't some spirit being floating around in heaven somewhere waiting to get a body. It's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, there's a passage in the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, verse one, it says this, the burden of the word of the Lord against Israel, thus says the Lord who stretches out the heavens lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Your spirit was formed within you when you were conceived. And so that's what the Bible teaches about us. So where was I before I was born? I was nowhere except in the thoughts of God. God always knew that I was coming and that whole thing. And so that's another one of those things that I would share with him. That was another one of those times when you know, poor Rick, you know, I was, I was, you know, it wasn't me. He should have been reading his Bible. 
That's, that's what should have been happening. But I remember sharing that with him and his mouth went open and he was like, oh, you know, that whole thing again. First man was of the earth made of dust. Second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. As is the heavenly man, so also those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Let me just end it with this. You all bear the image of the man of dust. There's a, there's a couple of passages in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter one, verses 27 and 28, it says that God made man in his image and in his likeness. And when you get to Genesis chapter five, the Bible says that Seth had a, or a, excuse me, Adam had a son and his name was Seth. And Seth was made in Adam's image, in Adam's likeness. And basically what that passage is saying is that when Adam started off, and Eve too, because it includes her, when Adam and Eve started off, they were made in the image of God in the sense of they had the same kind of, of, of nature that God had as far as his heart and will and all of those things. And when they fell, what happened was Adam began passing on his nature to his children. And we're all sons and daughters of Adam. And we're all fallen. That's what it's speaking about when it says you bear the image of the man of dust. That's the sin in my life. I'm really sick of it. I'm really sick of the image of the man of dust. I'm going to be glad when it goes away. And then what's going to happen is I'm going to bear the image of the heavenly man, like we were talking about before. When you become a Christian, what happens is God comes inside and he doesn't do it through a bunch of works and he doesn't do it through a bunch of discipline and he doesn't do it through a bunch of stuff. He comes inside and when you yield your heart to him, he begins changing you from the inside out. It's not about religion. It's not about works. It's all about a relationship with Christ. And you die, what, what you were, begins going away. And what God's going to make you starts coming into existence. And when God finally comes back for you, whether it's through death or whether it's what, through what we're gonna talk about next week, the rapture, the resurrection, when that happens, then you're gonna be perfected. No more sin, no more junk, no more, like I said, looking in the mirror going, what's wrong with you? That kind of thing. None of that is gonna go on anymore. And you're going to be perfect. There's a song that's on um, some of the Christian stations. I hate it. And I'm sorry if you like it, but I'm gonna rip on it. It's the, the song that goes, there could never be a more beautiful you. There could be, never be a more beautiful you. That kind of thing. I, here's the reason that I hate it. It's like, you know, if I'm singing that, there could never be a more beautiful me. You know, it's like, well, yeah, no room for improvement here. <laughs> Already done. There can never be a more beautiful me. Nonsense. Nonsense. I got real issues. And the older I get in the Lord, the more evident that they, they become. I hate songs like that because there could be a more beautiful me. And God's in the process of getting rid of the old me and making me into the new me. And I would kind of like to get there. I wouldn't like to stop right here. You know what I mean? And that's what we're looking forward to. Jesus is changing you. Sometimes, you know, you just get discouraged and you, and you wonder, you know, like I was saying, what's wrong with me? What's, what's going on with me? And what's going on with you is God is causing you to die to yourself. Go with it. See what he makes. It's gonna be awesome. So we'll qu quit right there. Let's pray. Father, again, we just come before you and thank you, Lord, for the fact that you are doing a work in our lives. God, I just thank you that um, you're a God who doesn't leave us the way that we are. You're, um, you, you come to us the way that we are and you accept us the way that, you, that we are. You love us the way that we are, but you're not interesting, interested in leaving us that way. And I, I just thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for the, the changes that you make in our lives, Lord. Thank you even for the trials. Paul was talking about dying daily. And many times that just happens through trials. Thank you, Lord, that you're getting, getting rid of the, drunk, the junk and the dross and you're uh, making us awesome, Lord. Looking forward to it. Father, I thank you for these people and for their hearts towards you. And I just wanna pray for those that may not know you and just pray that you give them boldness to finally come to a relationship with you. And uh, God, we just ask that you do all this stuff in Jesus' name, amen.